What's up everyone, it's Derek Elliott from Dirk.com and today we're making this little hot sauce ad. We'll model the bottle, make it glassy, add some lights, add some sauce, add the label, wrap the label, crinkle some plastic with a cloth simulation, add texture to it, saucy the sauce, make the label pop, sculpt some details in the glass, make the glass wavy, and boom! That's just the first part. After that, we'll create two separate shots with fire simulation, animated cameras, animated lights. We'll render it all out, string our flames, sorry, frames together in the Blender video sequencer. It's lit, it's hot. This tutorial is fire. I hope you enjoy it. Let's begin. Okay, so jumping right into the modeling, I'm just adding a circle with the default 32 vertices, doing some insetting with the I command. What I'm doing right now is just modeling the bottle and starting with the bottom and just kind of working my way up with the shape. Of course, this is something we can edit as we go along, but just adding a little bit of a lip there where the cap would go, insetting at the top, and then sort of just manually modeling inside the bottle. You can see here, I like to do this manually versus with the Solidify modifier. Just gives me a little bit more of a natural result. So bringing this down a little bit, just beveling that bottom, making sure I have that face filled in and an inset for good measure. Now to smooth the whole thing out, I'm going to go ahead and add a subdivision surface modifier. I'll bump the levels up to two on that. And then using edge loops, I will control some of those edges to get them just a little bit sharper so we don't have such a rounded form. And then shading that smooth. Now to control some of the tighter areas, rather than using additional edge loops, I'm actually going to use a bevel modifier and make sure that's before the subdivision. And then I'll use the weight limit method and then define where I want the bevel to be applied in that panel on the side right there. So just setting where I want the bevel to be to a value of one, and then making sure that bevel is set to a relatively low value. Of course, this does depend on the size of your scene, and we're modeling this bottle much larger than it would actually be in real life. It's like really, really tall right now, but adding the bevel to those places on the lip and then just kind of going back and forth between object mode and edit mode to sort of check the profile, make sure no parts of my glass are too thin. And once it's looking pretty good, sort of just, you know, checking it again, making sure the shape is what I like. And I think that that is looking pretty good. So I'm going to select this edge ring right here, duplicate it, and I'm going to use that to make sort of a cap. Now, we're not really going to see the cap, but I know some of you won't want to do the plastic on top, so um, you might want to have the cap in there, but I'm just modeling it here in case it affects kind of the look of it when we do wrap the plastic around it, um, but something like that, pretty simple, looks pretty good. Now, just splitting my viewport up here so that I can start to set up a little bit of a scene, adding some lights, making sure I'm in the Cycles render engine. You could follow along with EV, though some things like glass might not look as good in EV. Um, I like to turn my world strength down to zero just so I have a sort of a black world, and then pressing Shift A and adding lights into the scene just so that we can kind of see what we're working on because the next thing we're gonna do is start adding some materials to this scene. So just dragging and positioning those lights, duplicating them, um, I usually like to start with one kind of on top of the object and then adding those two on the side just so that we have sort of a nice illumination. And so that we can see it a little bit better, just adding a little bit of a ground plane there. And then with the bottle selected, just adding a new material, calling it glass. And this one's pretty simple. We're just going to take this transmission weight, drag it up to one, bring the roughness down a little bit. And if it's looking kind of funny, you might need to press shift N to recalculate your normals just to make sure things are pointing the right way and also make sure that your glass is sort of a pure white material. So adding another material to the same object and then assigning that to the cap object, just making that sort of a basic black material. And I think that's gonna look fine. Again, I'm gonna cover that up with my design so it's not a huge deal. So then Control plus to grow my selection inside the bottle and then Shift D to duplicate it and that's going to be my sauce object. So after I separate that so that it's a separate object, just insetting and sort of filling in that area a little bit. And then so that we can get a better look at it, just kind of pulling it outside the bottle there and renaming that material to sauce. And for now, we'll just give it sort of a simple red color and then maybe bring the roughness down a little bit. So I want that top edge to be a little bit sharper. So I'm adding in some creasing and then just also insetting some extra geometry so that it fits nicely. And it looks a little weird here, but that's because it's sort of perfectly intersecting with our glass. So I need to 
one thing you could do is just kind of scale it up a little bit. But the way I like to do that is actually with a displace modifier. And you could set the strength to a negative value, but in this case, my normals were flipped again. So just shift N to recalculate those. And then setting that strength to a very low value. And I needed to do a little bit of tweaking here on the top just to make sure that that's intersecting properly. And once that's all sort of squared up and I don't have those intersections, I'm in pretty good shape. But again, we are gonna cover that section, but just for good measure. Moving the lights around a little bit, making sure that they look pretty good. And I'm gonna go ahead and add in my label texture. So using the images as planes import add-on, um, adding that in, and that will just sort of, yeah, add that image as a plane with the uh, texture already hooked up to it. Um, now there was a lot of white space around my label. So I'm just gonna turn on my texture view here, right there, and add in some edge loops and just kind of cut that out. So just adding a couple edge loops around the border of the label, selecting that middle face and then control I to invert the selection and delete those extra faces around the outside so that I've just got my label. Now let's talk a little bit about that label. So the label here is one that I created in a program called Procreate. It's a digital sketching tool that I use on my tablet with a little pencil thing. To be honest, I haven't used it a ton since I really like sketching in a regular notebook, but I thought using Procreate for this project would be perfect because I could brush up on my skills and create a cooler hand-drawn label that I might not normally do. And since it had been a while, I jumped over to Skillshare to check out what kind of classes were available and holy cow, there are a ton on Procreate alone. If you haven't heard of Skillshare before, it's the world's largest online learning community for creatives and they've got classes on all sorts of things from productivity to sketching and wink wink there is a complete blender learning path that i created together in collaboration with skillshare just a little while ago it's pretty fresh we go from the basics of the interface and some simple modeling into building out a full room scene and the last class in the path we dive deeper into some product animation where we created this mock-up skincare advertisement. The learning path is easy to follow and it's jam-packed with knowledge, whether you're more beginner or intermediate, and that will get you right up to speed. So join me and thousands of other teachers and start learning by doing. The first 500 people to use my link in the description below will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. Don't wait any longer to learn that new thing and get started today. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Okay, so back in the scene here, the way I'm gonna attach this label to the bottle is with a shrink wrap modifier. But if we just add it right there, we can see it's not really doing exactly what we want. And that's because we need some additional geometry. So just control R to add some edge loops, scroll up till we have a bunch of them. And then it wraps a little bit better, but still looking a little funky. Uh, first thing I did though, just adding a solidify modifier to give that a little bit of thickness, and then I wanna move that object as close to the surface of the bottle as I can so that we get a little bit less distortion. But to get even less distortion, we can add in a simple deform modifier to sort of pre-bend it before it gets shrink-wrapped. So to do that, we need to make sure that the simple deform modifier is above the shrink-wrap so that that happens first. And I'm gonna check this box so that in edit mode, I can actually see how much that's bending. I'm just gonna bend it as best as I can so it's Pretty much right on the bottle but then the shrink wrap is sort of taking care of the rest of it there so we can see the bottle has the label on it now and that's looking pretty decent uh, go ahead and shade that smooth and then to make sure that the edges of the solidify are not smooth we added in that new um, smooth by angle modifier now i wasn't quite loving the way the label was looking on the shape of the bottle so just doing a little cleanup on the shape of the bottle here so that we have it you know, sort of proportional to the size of the label. Um, now trying to slide it up in case we did wanna go over that curve, uh, not gonna work very well without some additional loop cuts. So adding there some additional loop cuts and uh, yeah, it's looking, looking a little bit better. And now if we did need to move it up onto the curve, it would be fine. So don't forget to save your file. Now would be a good point to do that. Control S is gonna be your hotkey there. But um, I'm going to go into my color management and change this to high contrast just to give it a little extra pop. And I am using the AGX color space, which is sort of the new, more realistic recommended color space. But all in all, I think this is looking pretty good. So next thing I wanna do is go ahead and add in 
that sort of plastic wrap around the top of the bottle. And I'm gonna do that with a cloth simulation. So starting off by just sort of modeling around the top of the bottle until we have sort of that whole area that we want encompassed, deleting that top face. And then because it's gonna be a cloth simulation, um, quads are gonna look a little better here. So adding a grid fill to make sure that that top is filled in with the grids. And then, yeah, just adding edge loops until I've sort of got square faces. Then turning on the cloth simulation, you can see it just falls right down. That's not what we want. So selecting the bottle object, we'll add that as a collision object. And it's not quite sucked right up against the bottle. So changing the collision distances down a little bit is going to help us out with making that a little bit more accurate. And then I also want to sort of shrink this to the bottle. So I'm using the pressure settings with a negative value here to make sure that that is working. But kind of going the wrong way. And I think it's the normals again. So shift in to recalculate your normals or just search for it there like I did. And then it should be shrinking properly. Now it's not colliding with the top very well. Um, that could just be the quality. But another thing we can do is just slow down the speed of the simulation. So I, I had turned back the simulation speed right there basically to slow it down a little bit. Then just adding in a solidify again and our new smooth by angle to make sure the bottom is nice and sharp. So we can also add another subdivision on top of this so that the whole thing is just a little bit smoothed out, but it's not using the extra geometry to actually calculate our simulation. So selecting an area here and then pressing X to delete just the faces will leave edges that basically are going to be kind of stitches. And if we go into our class settings and turn on sewing, they'll sort of pin those together so that it kind of, you know, sucks up and we sort of get that perforated edge look. This would totally be easy just to model on your own, but I thought it was kind of fun to do it with a cloth simulation. So just adjusting some settings there, the tension is going to reduce or turning down the tension stiffness will make it so that it can stretch a little bit more. Playing with the vertex mass is another thing I'm messing with a little bit there. And then just also adding another edge loop around the top that can be sewn, filling in that spot so that you know, we've got just some extra details there that'll look really nice with the lighting. So let's add a material to this. I'm gonna just name that plastic cover, make it black, make it a little bit shiny. And then I also do want to add sort of a texture to this. So I had drawn these kind of faces that initially I wanted to use for my label design, but didn't end up making it into the final cut. So I'm just doing a quick unwrap on the mesh there. And then control T with my node Wrangler add-on, you know, I need to enable that right here. Just search for Wrangler and it'll be right there. So that'll add the image texture, the mapping and the texture coordinate nodes. And then I can select the texture I wanted to use. And here's a little time-lapse of me sketching those faces since Procreate does have that cool little time-lapse option. And then just sort of moving my UVs into place so that those faces are kind of everywhere. And decided I actually needed to add some seams there so that it mapped a little bit better, but just moving those islands kind of into their proper location, just so we have sort of full coverage and just also looking in the viewport to see kind of how that's mapped. Not worried about getting this perfect, but I think it's looking pretty good. And I didn't necessarily want that to control the base color, but I used it to control the roughness and I don't want it going from zero to one, but instead I'd rather have it go um, from something else. So remapping those values. So the black values are zero, the white values are one. So I'm taking the black values, mapping them to 0.4 and the white values to 0.2 so that the faces are a little bit rougher than the rest of it. Just kind of looks like it's, you know, laser etched or something like that. And then I can use that same texture plugged into the height of a bump node, which is then plugged into the normal to give that a little bit of a bumped out texture, a little bit more embossed or something, bumped in, bumped out, embossed, debossed, I'm not sure which is which, but adding the texture to the top right there might as well, why not? And just letting my simulation play through until I think it looks pretty good. And once it does feel pretty good, you can basically just apply that simulation so that it's kind of a locked object. So just pressing Control A, hovering over that modifier, and now it's just a single locked object that I can you know, do whatever I want with, but wouldn't want to do too much more UV unwrapping and definitely can't do any more simulation at this point. The metal looks pretty cool, but I think I'll go back to black and adjust my roughness values there just a little bit. And uh, yeah, I think the, uh, I think the bottle's kind of coming along pretty good here. Now's another 
good spot to save your file. Let's do a little bit more work on this hot sauce texture. I'm gonna do something real simple, just adding a noise texture, just so it looks like it's not one solid color, but there's sort of something going on there. And then using the object input, and then plugging the factor of the noise into the color input of the principal shader. And then I'm gonna use a color ramp to control those colors. Now I had copied the color by hovering over and pressing Control Z, or Control C, so I can just press Control V right here and paste that same red back in. And then just kind of playing with the scale, maybe giving it a little bit of distortion, playing with that color ramp some more, just until, again, you know, this isn't super visible, but just adds a little bit of detail as you can see here. So shift control click on that color ramp to get a better look at it. And I think it turned out looking decent. So I'm moving that back into the bottle and uh, yeah, we're looking pretty solid. So let's do a little bit more work on this label. So we've got the, just the black and white texture going into the color now, and that looks fine. But I actually made a couple other textures here. The first is this bump texture. So if we take a closer look at that, what I did is basically just kind of darken some areas of the texture so that they were a little bit more gray and then blurring other parts of the texture so that they you know, had not so harsh of an edge, which this type of thing works really well when you're using a bump map, blurring it. So if we plug that into the normal and then we're gonna add a vector bump node, drop that right there, plug that into height, and you can see what I'm talking about. We've got a little bit of a more kind of gradual embossed look right there. So turning the distance value, turning the distance value down pretty small, and then also controlling the strength to get that looking just the way we like. And it is looking pretty good. We try looking at it in black. That's kind of a cool look, which does make me think we'll probably need to move these lights around and then maybe also influence the roughness a little bit, maybe even the metallic. Um, so I did make yet another texture from that same black and white image which was the color. So if we take a closer look at that, that's basically just the same texture and then not worried about drawing outside the lines at all there, but just adding a little bit of color to make that sort of exciting. I did this in Photoshop just with a sort of a soft brush to get those gradient looks. Um, so that plugged into the color looks pretty good and just makes it a little bit more exciting. So now I've got this other texture here. I'm gonna use that to control the metallic value. So the areas that were white are going to have a metalness value of one, so fully metal. And then the more gray ones are going to be partially metal, which isn't really a realistic thing, but I think in this case it's going to look totally fine. So I had to come up with something to do with this original texture that's just black and white. And I think I'll use that to control the roughness here. So if we take a look at it now and we want to remap those ranges, again, we've got White is one and rough, black is zero and shiny. So I wanna remap those so that the zero, which was the black, I want just to be maybe like a 0.3. And then the areas that were white, I want to be like a 0.1. So a little bit more shiny. And taking a closer look, we can kind of see what that does. Sort of a nice, really like high gloss area, especially when combined with that bump map. You can see down there on the high heat portion of my beautifully hand sketched, well, digitally sketched logo. But yeah, looking pretty solid. Adjust those values just a little bit more. Maybe don't want it quite so shiny, but play with those until you get it about how you like. And I think it's looking pretty good. Now I wanna do a little bit of sculpting on this object just to give the glass a little bit more detail. Like there's just something else going on there. Um, but I need to have a little bit more resolution on my mesh to do that sculpting. So I made a duplicate and just moved it into a new collection that I called copy. And yeah, I just need more geometry sort of in this area. So just growing that selection with control plus, subdividing it, making it smooth so that it doesn't get too faceted and something like that will look pretty good. Maybe a couple extra loop cuts in these areas will help us out a little bit. And then to sculpt on this, I'm gonna use a shape key and I'll just name that sculpt and then turn the value on that shape key up to one. And that is important to do if you're gonna be sculpting. If you try to sculpt and it's at zero in that shape key, it's not really gonna do anything. So give my space self a little more space in the viewport here going into sculpt mode. And then, yeah, now we can just kind of draw on this bottle whatever we want. And, you know, I expect you all to do sort of whatever you want, but in my case, I thought a, a nice serif D might look nice. So just using the sort of basic tools here to kind of draw this out. Taking my time, take all the time you need. This isn't gonna be super visible, but 
just trying to make that popped out a little bit. And then also using the crease tool right here to sort of just sharpen some of those areas so that it is a little less blended in the shape. Maybe hope it will make it a little bit more visible, just kind of giving it a little bit of an edge there. And we can always turn this whole thing down a little bit by just reducing the value on that shape key. But just kind of being sort of sloppy, but you know, sort of handmade, you know, it feels a little bit more natural. And then uh, using the smooth brush here, which is a little too powerful right there, turn down the strength a tad, uh, just to smooth it all out since when I was sculpting, it was a little inaccurate. So the smooth brush will help me smooth that out as the name would suggest. And yeah, once that's looking pretty good again, you can just play with this value right here until it looks kind of the way you like. And I think that that is looking pretty good if we take a closer look. Yeah, not super visible, but in certain lighting scenarios, you know, maybe you would see that a little bit better. So this glass bottle right now is super sort of regular shape, but I want to make it look like it's a little bit more like hand blown or I don't even know how these glass bottles are made, but there's usually a little bit of waviness to it. So just adding a noise texture in, sort of similar to uh, what we had done before, but just using the noise texture like we did on the hot sauce to control the bump value of the glass. And you can see that those reflections are just getting a little bit wavy now. And I think that really goes a long way to sort of make it look just a little bit more realistic. So playing with my lights right here, moving them to a new collection called LCA, which stands for Lights, Camera, Action, and then adding an empty to the scene as well as a camera into that same LCA collection. So I add the empty so that I can control the camera with it. So Shift A, adding a camera, moving that back, and then parenting it to the empty with Control P. And then I can take that empty and just kind of move it up like this until it looks sort of straight at it. And then I'll go ahead and set my resolution here too. You can do whatever you want, of course, but I thought vertical would work pretty well for this bottle shape because it's kind of vertical. And you know, clients all the time these days, they want the vertical animations for social media. So yeah, looking pretty good. Just add a rough texture to this floor, just something black with a little shininess will look pretty good. And then, so that we're not rendering outside the frame, just add in a render border with Control B and uh, yeah, looking uh, looking pretty darn good. This is sort of ready to render whenever. I'm noticing it's a little bit dark in the front of the bottle though. So took this plane and added it in. Now I don't want to actually see that plane. So down here in my shading tab, I can uncheck camera for the ray visibility. And now you see we have sort of this nice reflecting thing and we'll name that material reflector. And I usually just leave that a white, but you could actually make it a color or bump the value up on that really high to like 15. So that's basically taking the light from our lamps and reflecting it back onto the object. So, you know, if we change the color there, you can see kind of what that's doing, but that just helps illuminate the front of the bottle a little bit better without using a actual lamp. So now just adding in another empty and I'm going to use that to just kind of control the whole bottle in case I need to move it around. So selecting each of my parts, the label, the plastic, the sauce, the bottle, and then control P to parent it to this empty. And now if I just, I'm pressing R twice to just sort of free rotate. Now I just have this one object I can use to sort of control the whole bottle. And I usually want that to be kind of in the middle. And yeah, it's looking, uh, it's looking pretty good. Hopefully yours is coming along nicely as well. Go ahead and save your file if you haven't already. We're gonna move on to the next part, which is gonna be adding some fire to these scenes, but before we do that, let's just get our shot kind of set up. So I'm making sure I'm in 30 frames per second. And I set the duration of this animation to be 90 frames. So that'd be three seconds. I just kind of want this to be sort of a simple detail shot. But I want to be able to rotate the bottle on the Z axis, but I want to move the whole thing up. So I'm actually parenting the empty to another empty. And I'm using one empty to kind of control the location. And then that original empty, I can just rotate on the local Z axis to kind of spin the bottle, um, you know, in a more expected way. So just inserting some keyframes there, maybe it starts facing kind of one way and then we spin it sort of back the other way until it's looking pretty good. Now I want to have this be a linear interpolation. So just pressing T up in that graph editor or on the timeline below with those keyframes selected, we'll make it so that that's a nice steady rotation. It doesn't have any sort of Bezier curve interpolation. 
So now I'm just kind of finding my shot here, moving my camera controller empty around, changing the focal length. Higher focal length is gonna give you less perspective and work a little bit better for you know, a, a product type shot. And then I added some depth of field in as well, just so that we get a really nice like detail shot of that label where the rest of it's kind of blurred out, but we can really focus on sort of those embossed details that we spent some time working on. So then just slowly moving around, kind of changing the angles here until I find something that I think is working, just you know, pressing spacebar to play the animation, making sure everything is set to linear so that it's kind of one constant motion. And I think that's looking pretty good. Maybe pull the camera out a little bit and insert some keyframes there. That's looking pretty good. Maybe push the camera in a little bit, insert some keyframes. And then you can actually just move, yeah, those whole keyframes in the graph editor with G. Uh, let's make sure this one's set to linear as well, which as you can see, we can do it down there too. It doesn't have to be in the graph editor, but I usually like to have a graph editor pulled up. For this exact reason, I can just sort of select one keyframe and, and move it within the uh, graph editor rather than having to adjust the actual values. So sort of undoing some of my work there. I wanted to straighten the bottle out a little bit, but yeah, just... This is sort of a slow process, and you know, if you're going to spend time on anything with this animation, this is exactly it. Uh, let's check that normalize option so they're not all wonky in the curve editor. But yeah, just moving things around, slowly looking at it. I was going to cut all this out, but you know, I figured it was probably worth the, you sort of seeing the process here. So feel free to watch this on a little bit slower speed, just to kind of see. I mean, this is what I do all the time for client animations and stuff. Is is a lot of just moving keyframes around, moving lamps around until I get the look right. Decided those lamps on the side weren't really helping me a lot, so I deleted those and thought it might be easier just to work with this one lamp, which will also make it easier if we wanna, you know, kind of animate that lamp, have it moving around. But um, the shot is starting to look pretty good, so I'm gonna start thinking about the simulation, like where I want the fire to come up. So I'm just adding in a plane object right there stretching it out a little bit, and that's gonna be my emission object, but uh, not before I undo the work I did again with the uh, the framing of the shot. I thought, you know, if I'm moving the camera empty around, it probably doesn't make sense for the bottle to also be at a weird angle. So um, just setting the bottle so it's back straight, and then doing a little bit more work on the camera object itself. Again, making sure everything is set to linear so that we have sort of that smooth, cinematic, sweeping motion rather than any sort of ups and downs with the with the speed ramps, if you will. I think that's what some other software calls that. Now just kind of dragging this light back and forth, thinking about what it might look like if I you know, started on one side and then maybe it kind of moves over to the other. So just pressing I in those fields to insert keyframes, setting those to linear as well. And yeah, it's looking like a little bit of a nicer animation, maybe not loving the way that lamp is positioned. So just drag that over, insert keyframes again, and you don't have to reset the interpolation each time, but um, this is one cool trick right here. So if you check use nodes on the lamp object, we can add in a black body and then plug that into the color, and then we can set a realistic uh, Kelvin, I think it is, color temperature. So a higher value is gonna be closer to like a blue light, and something like a 4000 is sort of a warm, like closer to a candle light. So that looks pretty good and just gives a little more heat to the animation, if you will. I thought it kind of matched the, the general style of everything we were doing here, but I think the lighting and animation looks pretty good right there. So with that set up, let's go back to this object that's gonna be our mission object. Now, just clicking on quick smoke right here with the, so we had the emission object that I created selected. And then when I click quick smoke, it will automatically add a domain object sort of around it. And if we play that, you can see that it's already working, it sort of immediately starts simulating this smokiness, but uh, obviously a lot of work to do here. So first thing I'll do is with the bottle selected, I'll add a fluid effector and change that to collision so that the smoke actually collides with the bottle rather than trying to go through it like it was before. Um, so we can see if we look at that, that it should be interacting with the bottle. And I decided that you know, it's gonna take a minute for this simulation to sort of get to where I want it to be, maybe about 30 frames. 
So I'm taking my whole animation, so just A in the viewport to select everything, and just moving all those frames in the graph editor over so that it starts at 30. So those first 30 frames, I'll probably just cut. I won't even you know, put them in the animation. I'll still simulate them, but that's gonna be where the fire kind of comes out of the simulation. But I do need a little bit more space within my kind of domain for the smoke simulation. So just scaling that up. The larger this is, the more it's gonna take to, you know, get it, you know, for it to bake and everything like that. So don't go too too big or bigger than you need to, but you know, you do need enough space so that you get all the flames and stuff that you want happening properly. So um, just doing some organization, moving those files into a new collection that I called simulation. And we have a lot of options here we can play with. I'm not going to go through all of them, but we'll go through sort of the main ones. So changing the flow type, first of all, to fire, which in the viewport is going to look right, but in the render does not look right at all. So there is a couple pretty important things we need to do here to get this looking a little bit more far, more like fire. So let's change that to a shader editor up top. And this is all plugged into the volume shader, but I need to input an attribute and then manually type in heat, H-E-A-T right here. And then that will allow us to take this factor value because the simulation is actually outputting heat values. Um, so you can't really see those, but when you add the attribute in and then put that into the emission strength, you can see that a little better. Now, obviously this is still looking pretty bad. The viewport actually looks better than the rendered view, but uh, we can turn that density down to zero because we're not messing with smoke. So yeah, just turn the density all the way down to zero. You should be fine. Uh, even if you still see it on the left side in the viewport, um, you know, if, if the density is at zero, you shouldn't be getting any, yeah, any density from the smoke. So you could, you could have that on if you wanted it to look a little smokier, like, uh, I don't know, like it's wood burning around your bottle or something like that. But really the way this is going to happen is by adding that factor value into a color ramp and then have that go into the emission color. So just setting a couple colors really quickly here, maybe like a dark red on the left end and a more yellow on the right end. And then this is one thing we're going to be doing a lot of in this section and in the next section of the tutorial, but just playing with this color ramp, um, sometimes putting a darker value down on the right side will sort of cut out some of the, you know, some of the brightness there. And, you know, it might not be the most realistic method, but uh, it ends up looking a lot better when you do that. And then I also added a black stop on the left right there, just to kind of clamp down on some of those more smoky looking things. Now I just changed the resolution divisions um, higher. This is gonna be, yeah, basically like the quality of your simulation. You can see the higher resolution divisions, the more detailed your simulation is gonna be. And that was a beautiful other label that I designed but I didn't go with. Let me know in the comments if you uh, like the old one or, or the one I went with, but I'm gonna try changing this fuel option on the inflow object. So that's a kind of like emit more fire maybe. I don't know, really the best way to play with these fire simulations is a lot of guessing and checking. And that's basically what I'm gonna do a ton of now and in the rest of this tutorial. But one thing to make it maybe look a little bit more irregular is just reshaping, adding some subdivision to that emission object so that it's not just coming up all straight and uh, not looking so hot right there. So, well, this is looking very hot, but it's kind of like, I don't know, it's a little bit too splotchy. Like I, I don't I don't love the way the, the flames are looking right there. So uh, I'm going to add in a math node for one. And if we plug that between the factor and the emission strength and set it to multiply, we can turn that up and that'll help it be a lot brighter and that will help us a ton with the way that the, um, yeah, with the way that the simulation looks, just cranking that value up. But yeah, a little bit, a little bit too crazy here. So uh, we've got a lot of options here in the domain, which most of your smoke simulation, fire simulation options are going to be in the in the domain. So I'd recommend just playing with those values. Uh, the vorticity is kind of going to add some randomness to your simulation, which will make it probably more splotchy. Um, now, again, this all depends on the scale of your simulation, but you wanna use pretty low values probably with the vorticity. And then again, just playing with the color ramps, seeing if I can 
get this looking a little nicer. And you can totally use colors that aren't like oranges if you want to make it look, uh, I don't know, like ghostly or something. I thought it'd be cool to do like a ghost pepper uh, version where it's like, I don't know, blue or purple smoke or something. Um, but to bake the simulation, I changed the cache type to all. And then also want to turn up the divisions on the simulation so it's a little bit higher res. Um, now I started baking this one, but well, before I do, just make sure the settings are what I like. Sure, looks good. I started baking it, but um, it seemed like it was going way slower than it should for 128 subdivisions. So just canceled it, took a look at it. And yeah, I think it's all that additional vorticity. Um, also just, you know, maybe I don't need to be at 128 now, dropping that to 96. Try 0.05 on the vorticity, bake that again. Uh, now I think this one went a little bit faster. So uh, less vorticity, less moving around, less for the computer to calculate. And this is all going to depend on your hardware. But um, that's starting to look a little bit better. You know, there's some other things we could do, but messing with these simulations is a very deep, very dark hole. Um, so I'll continue to keep playing with this a little bit, maybe turning the heat down, maybe reshaping my domain, reshaping my emitter object, just trying to tighten up the domain for a little bit faster bakes, realizing that the top of that isn't quite in view. So maybe I can pull that down. You want this as small as possible, but big enough to, you know, allow fire where you need it. Uh, so the temperature values is another thing that I played with. Um, don't notice like huge effects there, but again, guess and check, bake it, see what it looks like. This can be very tedious, very long. So this one actually looked pretty good, um, but there's sort of that dark area in the bottom right corner of the animation that wasn't loving. Like I wanted the fire to come up on that side a little more. I mean, I purposely pushed it to the left so it wouldn't cover the label too much, um, but I think I do need a little bit more over there. So just sliding that out a little bit and then try and turn that fuel down. Maybe that'll help it be a little less crazy. Um, and then again, just messing with some more values here, change that down to 64, give it a bake. If you change a lot of values, then it's probably best to do your bake at a lower resolution just so you can make sure it's not going crazy. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think that it, it's looking, it's looking better and we can see that the effector is nicely, you know, the flame is going around the bottle like we wanted to, but yeah, still a little dark in that corner. So just adding another object, adding some randomness, not another object, but just another like kind of floating plane within that emission object, giving that one a bake and let's hide that emitter object. Yeah. Okay. So now this is looking, I would say much, much closer, looking a little bit better. And then let's just cut off those first 30 frames and do a little bit more adjusting with maybe our our lamps here. Maybe we start with the lamp low power, inserting a keyframe, going to end our animation, pulling that up a lot higher, insert another keyframe, and let's set that to, I guess it doesn't have to be linear. So just playing with the Bezier curve. So sort of where you see that steep curve is kind of where the light would sort of flash on. So this isn't fully a, an animation tutorial. Curves are something to learn a lot about, but just trying to spice it up a little bit. And yeah, thinking like, okay, what, you know, maybe I should do a color. Would a color look cool? But all in all, I think that, you know, it's looking pretty sweet. Need to adjust the multiply value so it's not so bright, or in this case, adding some keyframes so that, you know, maybe it starts out really bright and then it kind of cools off. You can sort of do whatever you want. But once you feel like it's good, go ahead and select an output folder because we're going to go ahead and render this. Um, so what you type down there is what the frames will be called. And then just making those last final adjustments, seeing if it looks the way we want it to look and maybe move the camera just a little bit. You know, before you render, of course, you want to make sure everything is how you like it, but then go up to the render tab in the top left and select render animation and it will start to render. Now I'm just using 200 samples here with denoising, which should be plenty. Honestly, I think it'll look, I think it'll look fine. So um, render that out once it finishes, which I cut out the part where it's rendering. So it's done rendering. 
Um, I'm in a Blender video sequence editor. Just go file, new, video editing, add in your image sequence, make sure your resolution is right. Press A to select all those, and then you can play it back. And it actually is going backwards here. For some reason, the frames imported backwards. That's something I did, um, not on purpose. But I think I actually, <laughs> I think for the remainder of this tutorial, this shot stayed backwards, but kind of works. Not really a big deal. So let's move on to the, the final shot, the next part of the tutorial, uh, where we're going to sort of do the same thing, but different. This part will be a little bit shorter because we kind of covered a lot of the fire settings, but just saving over that same file with a new name, um, because this has already got the fire material that we worked on. It's already got the domain. It's already got the smoke object. Just need to set that up to be 210 frames long, so it's seven seconds. The previous was three seconds, so that would give us a total of a 10 second animation. Um, just moving my domain around here to encompass what I need for the new animation, which is a little bit of extra height. Um, probably don't need it to be so deep. And I'm in this in the emission object, just deleting all the planes that were there, and then adding in a circle object. So I have this kind of ring of fire to play with, and then changing my cache back to replay so that I can kind of more rapidly do my adjustments there. And then let's move that below the bottle so that the flames will come up around it. And we can just get rid of that plane because I'm going to kind of remodel a new platform onto which the bottle will sit, which you'll see later, the bottle actually does not sit on the surface, but just kind of creating a little column platform center area thing there in the middle for the bottle to float a couple millimeters off of. And yeah, just platform, fire comes up, looking pretty cool. Totally covers our label though, which I don't love. Get our camera set up a little bit better first. Let me pull that back a tad in the graph editor there. Just, you know, sort of thinking about where do I want this sh shot to start? Where do I want it to end? Very fine tuning until you have it right where you like it. And then uh, changing that to a Bezier curve. So that flatter end on the right side will mean the motion kind of slows. So a steeper curve in the graph editor is basically faster motion. So I want to mimic that same motion on the other things that I'm animating. So the camera pulling in, but also the camera rotating. So using that normalize option up there, I can just kind of look at the curves and just and just try to match them and where they, you know, you sort of want to intersect at that zero point. Um, so I didn't want the label to be so covered up. So just I'm going to delete sort of the front of this emission object. And then uh, let's take a look at what that looks like. Well, before we do that, let's add in a shear. I kind of want to, yeah, just tilt this a little bit so that the back comes up. You know, the flames in the back kind of come up a little bit before the ones on the side. And this is all just hidden by the, you know, by the little column that we made there. So let's go and add our collision effector to our platform object so that it goes through the hole, but not through the object. And uh, looking fine, a little bit too straight. Probably gonna be thinking about adding some vorticity, maybe even some force fields. Uh, another thing we can do like we did before is just randomize the shape of that a little bit. And I, I was just using proportional editing with the random feature on, and that will allow that to be a little bit more irregular. And the flames are already looking a tad bit better, but Lighting, not perfect, but I might go ahead and add in that reflector object like I did before, add in some other lights. Now we probably want this to start off pretty dark, but you know, a lot of times I'll start doing my animation kind of in a way that where I want it to end, just so I sort of have my final shot, the more important part figured out. So adding some vorticity in there, maybe 0.1, let that play a little bit, see how it's looking. It's looking, uh, it's looking decent could be better maybe a little bit more work with the color ramp here maybe we want a little bit of extra extra action in this shot and then just scaling my domain down because i didn't need to be quite so big and then adding in some keyframes for the location of each lamp and then also keyframing the power 
adding a little bit of a backdrop there, just a cube, pulling the ceiling of my domain down a little bit because it's out of view. And with those things set, bake the animation, and it baked very fast, again, because I cut out the part where it baked. Looking a little splotchy, not fantastic. And you don't always want to ditch the bake right away. You know, it might be something that you can fix with like the color ramp. So just, yeah, endlessly kind of playing with these values. I'm not getting the black clipped quite the way I want. So changing some settings, taking another look at that. Kind of back to square one here. It's not, uh, it's not looking quite right. Not sure what it is. Guess and check. Maybe we need a force field to uh, mix this up. So just adding in a force with a negative strength value and baking it. And that should sort of pull the fire towards the force, which the force is a little bit too centered up. So uh, let's change that back to replay so we can do some more, more live testing here. And then adding some keyframes for that force field. And you can see that it's kind of dragging the fire, which gives it a lot more interest, I would say. Uh, and, you know, rather than adding vorticity or something like that, just adding in that force field and then animating the force field to kind of move around will also move those frame, flames around. And I thought it looked cool if I dropped that force field below the surface so that the flames kind of went back down to bring the focus back onto our bottle object. Um, so that is, yeah, it's looking a lot better. It looks pretty cool. I like the way that it sort of leaves the bottle at the end there. And we've got that brightness kind of just happening at the uh, at the bottom of our bottle. So setting a new folder for our frames to be rendered into, making some last adjustments here to the value of that multiply until it's looking right. And then doing a test render, just seeing if it looks good. And thought maybe the floor could use just a little bit of texture. And then probably need to do a little bit of work with the lighting. Changing the spread on your area lamps is a really cool thing to play with. That can give you some really unique looks. Uh, and then just uh, rendering it out and seeing how it looks. And it finished. Voila, so fast. So I'm back in my video compile file that I saved. I'll bump up the duration to a full 10 seconds, 300 frames. And then I'll add in my image sequence. A to select everything and then add image strip. And again, I believe they went in backwards. I can't believe I never noticed it on the first one though. So yeah, that's going backwards. So we can just go down into our video tab on the right side, I think it is. Yeah, and then reverse frames. And yeah, I never noticed that it was reversed on the other one. So I guess it looked good to me. So it's good enough. You can reverse your frames back to the proper direction if you want. Select an output folder for that. And I use the sort of default FFmpeg video. Yeah, just not really changing anything there. That should give us a pretty, pretty low file size video. And yeah, uh, pretty much done. It'll render the folder you selected, play it, take a look at it. Boom, baby. That looks nice. I think it looks pretty good. I think it turned out good. Hopefully you made a cool one as well. You enjoyed it. Like and subscribe. Follow me on Instagram, Derek J. Elliott. Uh, share with your friends, tag me somewhere. I love you. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Enjoy your hot sauce animations. Share them with me. Thanks. Peace.